Father, I just want to thank God. Thank you for our music team. Because, Lord, there's a laying down of a life involved in uh, bringing worship to you. So I want to give you thanks for them, that you continue to strengthen them, that you would continue to humble them, that you would continue to help them bring a new level of worship in this house. As your word says, that the true worshipers will worship in spirit and truth. Thank you, Lord. Is that very loud? It sounds very loud to me. <laughs> Maybe I just, I'm loud back there, but <clears throat> I don't like being loud up here. It's okay. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I want to welcome all the Zoom people out there and welcome everyone here this morning, visitors or locals. Uh, we're just grateful to have you here today. Raph is um, preaching in a Thai church in Adelaide today. <clears throat> I was actually supposed to be with him, <laughs> but I think he forgot <laughs> when he asked me to pre preach today. Um, just one little thing. We are picking olives at the moment. <clears throat> and if anyone can at all lend a hand any day of the week <clears throat> to help us bring in the harvest of the olives, um, it would be very, very grateful. We need hands. We, we'll supply the buckets. We just need people to help with picking the olives off the tree around the boundaries. Um, hopefully we'll have a great harvest like we did last time. So thank you for that. Thanks, Wendy. Thank you, Lord. Father, I just want to thank you for this morning, for every heart that you've brought here today. And for those that didn't come or those that left, Lord, I pray a blessing on them, Lord. I just thank you, Father, for who you are and what you do. Thank you, Lord, that you saved us. You brought us together. You made us one with you. So this morning I pray that the Spirit of God would come and you would speak to every heart here today. I ask this in Jesus' name. I've had a uh, very tiring last few weeks, maybe six weeks, because we finally got some approval to do some work on our, on our block on Highmarsh Island. So it's been a... <clears throat> Pretty busy time um, organising things and I don't like to say too much but physically I can't do a lot and it's very frustrating for me uh, as a man who's worked hard all his life to then not be able to do what I want to do. And you know God th uses all things for his purposes and uh, I know that through this that when the healing does come, he'll have, he would have brought a change in here because that's what's needed. My pride um, hurts. It's been kicked and I guess in, in myself I've taken offence at that, not being able to do the things that I want to do as a man. And all it is is my pride. And uh, that's been hard. It's been a real battle. Um, not just in the last six weeks, but for the last three years or more, actually since 2012, I've had a major bucket full of health issues that you don't really probably know too much about. But I've had more than my share. And uh, I presented it, not in a good sense in one term, because in Christ... I'm free, and in Christ I'm healed. And that healing is mine to appropriate. It's mine. I know this, but we give up so easily trying to appropriate that so that it becomes the reality in our bodies. And every one of you would have some sort of testimony of battling something. So it's been a, um, a very humbling time, particularly. And I guess uh, I didn't actually realise that until this morning, what God was doing. I'm probably not the brightest 
light in the, in the bulb in the pack. But um, so often we go through these times through hardships, and we the first thing we would do is go to woe is me. Why is this happening to me? Um, this is not fair, you know. You paid the price for me. What am I going through? You, you, that's on you. It's not on me. Why have I got it? All these things go through your mind and you're wrestling with them. You know, at the crux of all of those things is what I just mentioned. It's pride in all of us. Our stinking, lousy pride. The one thing that God hates probably most of all things is pride. What does Satan represent? That Satan represented a pride that God kicked him clean out of heaven for it because he thought he was better than God. And so um, I remember a lot of times I'll, it's been introspective looking at my walk and I've always been not so, not so much proud, but I guess there's a pride in it, that I desire to know nothing except Christ and him crucified for me. Paul said those very things, but he had a deeper understanding when he said them. But when, he, when I read it, it did something in my heart because he is all I want. He's all I desire. And the things of the world take us away. Our, our daily work, our daily routine takes us away from the very thing that we need the most and that's Jesus Christ. Nothing else matters except to know him because knowing him is eternal life because our lives are going to be gone very quickly. I mean, I'm coming up to 63 years of age and I'm thinking, where did the years go? And I'm full of regrets because I'm thinking, if only you'd saved me earlier, I could have done a lot more for you and I could have, wouldn't have wasted so much of my life. I wouldn't have made so many mistakes. I wouldn't have hurt so many people. I wouldn't have accumulated so many unforgivenesses and resentments in my heart that have become hurts that I've needed to be healed, for, healed of. The same as you. Every one of us carries, and I'm going to single out the blokes today, because you guys are just downright stubborn like me. We need a good shaking. We don't have to be puffed up because that's not what love is. Love is not puffed up. Love is humble. Love wants to think the best of someone else even when you don't want to. Love wants to do the best for someone else even when you don't want to. Love wants to love the enemy that you don't want to love. And so I've been um, brought low. And I, I, uh, I feel very grateful for that. But it hurts. It hurts because I've got to let go of stuff. I've got to let go of my pride, my arrogance because I want to be like him, my Lord and Saviour, who came and died and gave everything for me. A cost that I cannot possibly comprehend with my mind. But you know, as I renew my mind in this, I get to know God more. And because I get to know God more, I get to know what he dislikes. And that's what's happening. I'm going along on my walk and now the thing he wants me to deal with is my pride because it's at the core of everything that holds me back. And in knowing him, I know that that's what he wants to do. God's got lots of ways of humbling you. And you'll be sure that he's going to do it for you if we don't listen, if we don't obey.
You know, Enoch, he walked with God and then he was no more. He got to know God so well he knew. He, even he was a family man, just like you and us. He, was, he had children, he had a family. And yet the more he worked with God, the more he saw what God saw. And he realized how corrupt the world was, just how bad the state of the world got. And that's back then. I wonder what he would think about now, the state of our world right now, the world in which we live, the world in which we try to live in, that very breath to live now is coming under fire. And when I say that, I mean that very breath is Christ. The very way of life to live in him is coming under fire. And it's going to get worse. You know, you think of the Christians in the past who, who lived and died for the sake of the gospel and died violently, gave their lives, shed their blood because of what they believed in. And I wonder, as we're sitting here this morning, how far would you be willing to go right now for the sake of the gospel? What is the extent of your belief? I remember hearing stories of men a father and two sons in India, who were, he was a preacher, and they were hated because they preached the gospel. And they set fire to them in their car and burnt them together. I mean, can you imagine that? What would a dad say to his child at that point as they're sitting in that car and this angry world is throwing firebombs at them? And they were incinerated. You know, I would like to think that the words of Jesus, and I know they would have been in his mouth at that time, and he would have comforted, comforted them. Because there's no other name but the name of Jesus. There's nothing more powerful than the name of Jesus. There's nothing more powerful than the word of God. But I'm speaking from my perspective this morning, my lack of knowing God troubles me. I can stand here and I can say I love God and I know in my heart I do. But then I think, oh, over the last few years, what have you been doing for God? Building his work here, that's all very well and good. But the last few years, I've also been hungering for the power of God to start working through me. And it's only my doubts and fears, it's only my unregenerated self that stops the fullness of God working through me. And you're no different. Rath's no different. We, we look at him like he's a benchmark, but he's not. He's not a benchmark. He does wonderful things. We are so grateful and so blessed to have him, not as a friend, but as our pastor and a wonderful example. But he's not the example. The man that hung on the cross was our example. And so my contemplating, it's, I want to ask you, what would you do? if it came to giving up your life for someone else's? These are sobering questions. It's a sobering question. What would you do for your family? Well, <laughs> I'd say I'd take a bullet for my wife or my children any day of the week. I, that, I don't have to think about it. But what would I do for John? Would I jump in front of a train for him instead of him getting hit and push him out of the way? I'd like to think I would. <laughs> But you don't know what you're going to do in any given situation. It's not about what you think you would do. It's about who you know.
It's about who you know, who you know him to be in your walk. If you know him to be your Lord and Saviour, that's wonderful. If you know him to be the healer of everything, that's wonderful. Because he is. But I'll put it, to, put it to you, each and every one of us, we know him very, very little to what we should know him. There's such a depth that we don't know to Christ that we have not attained to yet. Ever since I've been in the church, I look at the church and I wonder how it works, how it's supposed to work. How that we're supposed to have love one for another. How we're supposed to lay down our lives for each other. How a husband's supposed to lay down his life for his wife. Not to lord it over her, but, but to honour her. It's not an easy thing to do. We, we're men, we make mistakes. We're buffoons at times. I know I am. I've got two left feet at times. You try walking with two left feet. It's a bit awkward. And yet we're called to do this because that's what love is. That's the pattern he set us. The pattern of love. One for another. I was blessed this week. Just a little side thing because I was able to do a little Bible study with my sister over here. My wife and I went to her house and had a cuppa and we did a first little Bible study and I'd like to think we should do a few more. It was, um, it was a good time. Helping her get to know some of the Word of God and what that means so that she can comprehend in, in her life. But she's a beginner. So we should all be gathering around her, we should all be helping, we should all be encouraging her or anyone else. Young families, you know, they do it tough at times. They need a bit of a helping hand. How much do we do to lend a hand out there? How much do we show the love of Christ just to those within the family, let alone those outside? I didn't know I was going to be introspective today. I didn't know what I was going to even talk about. Because that's why, that why God keeps me on my toes, I guess, or humbled. There's something I do want to read you in a moment. And it's fairly sobering. I was um, listening to Derek Prince yesterday. And he's speaking on the natural progression, what we see in the world, what's happening, the evil, how the world is travailing. Something like from 1950, there was something like, say, nine earthquakes that year that measured over six. 1960, there was something like 30. 1970, there was something like 80. 1990, there was over 100. And who knows from then to here, over six magnitude. So what does that tell you? That tells me the whole earth is travailing and groaning within. And that's something that we should be doing as well. Because as the word of God goes in and grows in us and we get to know God more, we realise the hatred of sin that God has and the very nature of sin how subtle it can be, and yet we fail to recognise it because we go, she'll be right. I don't want to get involved in that. You know, little things we do in our everyday lives that we fail to examine whether it's a sin or whether it's not because we're, we grade our sin, whereas God doesn't. Sin is sin to God, no matter what it is, and he hates it. And so too, we need to hate the sin in us as well. I mean, I think in some ways, I mean, Enoch was pretty amazing. He uh, walked with God and then he was no more. He got to, got to know God so well that I don't know, he took him home. 
didn't see death. He's lucky. <laughs> Maybe a bit of a cop out. No, no, I don't say that. I don't know him. I know what I read about him. You know, Enoch itself means the initiator. It means dedicated and also initiator. He initiated a new kind of person because he was an example for us. He was a type of um, last day Christian. He walked with God and then he was no more. Likewise, we should be walking with God. But not to be no more, but to do the things that God wants us to do here on earth. You know, our lives are so busy, and that's what I've found these last few weeks particularly. I do my daily Bible reading, and I pray through the day off and on, <laughs> especially after I'm driving somewhere and I can't get where I want to go in a hurry because there's tourists everywhere, and I'm cussing them because they're in my way and holding me up. And then if you were sitting on the side of my heart, you would hear, I'm so sorry, Lord, what's wrong with me? What's wrong with me? Oh, you rotten mongrel, get out of the way. And I'm constantly doing this. I know you probably wouldn't do that, but that's something I do that I hate. And I'm trying to get rid of that habit. I'm asking God to le take it out of me. So, But as I said, most of the things we have to deal with are rooted in our pride. And you ladies aren't exempt from that. I was pick, picking on the men this morning because, to a degree, because we have a vital role to play. We're supposed to lead the way. We're supposed to set an example, not just for our wives, but for our children, for our community. We're supposed to lead. We're supposed to be leaders in our community. by being Christ-like, by calling out sin for what it is in, in the community, by setting a standard that you live by and you don't falter by it, that your integrity is in Christ and not in yourself. Because if you're living by your own integrity, it stinks. And I promise I'm not, I don't think I'm going to keep you very long today. Thank you, Lord. Back in 1968, I have read this before, but I think we, we need to grasp what are the signs of the times. We need to understand that our time, the time here is very short and it's culminating. And I would love this to say that we're all going to see the Lord come back in the clouds, the cloud of glory. But in 1968, an evangelist was in a meeting in Norway and a 90-year-old woman happened to be in that meeting at the time and she began to prophesy. Now I'm going to have to put my goggles on because I'm, I've wrote this down in the middle of the night. And she was uh, prophesied about the events that are coming. Now this is 1968. And you remember she's 90. So she was born in 1878. So you can imagine the changes she's seen in society from 1878 to 1968. It would be phenomenal. It would have been rapid. Not just considering what we've seen in our short lifetimes, but I found this really poignant. And she began to speak and she said, I saw the time just before the coming of Jesus and the outbreak of the Third World War. I saw the events with my natural eyes. I saw the world like a kind of globe. And I saw Europe, land by land. I saw Scandinavia. I saw Norway. 
I saw certain things that would take place just before the return of Jesus and just before the last calamity happens. A calamity the likes of which we have never before experienced. First, before Jesus comes and before the Third World War breaks out, there will be a dente, I think that's Hebrew, detente, an easing of tension between nations, I should have just said that, <laughs> like we have never had before. There will be peace between the superpowers in the East and the West, and there will be a long peace. You've got to remember this was during the Cold War in 1968, and it was at its height. In the period of peace, there will be disarmament in many countries. And you think of what's happened after the Cold War. Countries around the world signed peace pacts and they disarmed nuclear proliferation. They reduced their numbers. Even though to this day, there's enough nuclear war arsenal in the world to destroy the world 50 times over. And they've reduced it. So the mind boggles. There will be disarmament in many, in many countries, also in Norway. And we are not prepared when it comes, the Third World War. The Third World War will begin in a way no one would have anticipated it, and from an unexpected place. A lukewarmness, a lukewarmness will without parallel take hold of the Christians. A falling away from the true living Christianity. Christians will not be open for, a pen, uh, for penetrating preaching. They will not like in earlier times, they will not like in earlier times want to hear of sin and grace, law and gospel, repentance and restoration there will come a substitute instead. Prosperity, happiness. Prosperity and happiness, Christianity. I don't know about you, but there was a period during the what, 70s, 80s, when that sort of started really coming in. The prosperity doctrine was preached to death, and it still is, and it's wrong. It's wrong. Because all they're preaching about is money. And what's the root of all evil? Money. The love of money, exactly, the love of money. Money in itself is a good thing when it's used properly. But the love of money is the root of all evil. So if you're chasing money, I would seriously watch your motives and what you're doing and ask the Lord, what should you be doing? Because it's going to take you to hell. So no matter how much money you accumulate, that's where it's going to end up. The important thing will be to have success and to be something. We see this in a lot of churches. To have material things, things that God never promised us in this way. So if you remember the word of God, it says, Seek ye first the kingdom of righteous, my kingdom of righteousness and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. It didn't actually say the wealth of the world will be added unto you. Seven cars. Four houses, holidays every every six months. He just said, and these things shall be added unto you. What things? The things that you need to live day by day. Perhaps the things you need to be able to give to someone else if your heart is right with God. He didn't mean the riches of the world so you can be a Bill Gates and be a wonderful philanthropist and get accolades from the world. I desire to know Christ and nothing else in him crucified. That should be all our desire and all our focus. Churches and prayer houses will be emptier and emptier. Instead of the preaching we've been used to for the generations, through generations, to take up your cross and follow Jesus, Entertainment, art and culture will invade the churches. 
where there should have been gatherings for repentance and revival. This will increase markedly just before the return of Jesus. And you know, we're seeing that. We're seeing that now so much in so many churches. They don't want to offend. They want to be politically correct. Well, to, to hoots with political correctness, sin is sin, wrong is wrong, and right is right. You know, to change the laws so that homosexuality is legal. Well, it's not a, it might be legal, but it's not legal with God. It's an abhorrent mess. He loves the person, but he hates the sin that goes with it. And we need to stand firm in these things. The way this world is going is so disgusting. I sit home sometimes and I shake my head and I'm thinking, I wouldn't have done this before, but I got to know my God as I walk with him. And he hates it, so therefore I have to hate it too. And I do. But I feel helpless because I don't know sometimes what to do. And you probably do too. Sin is sin. There will be a moral dis disintegration that old Norway has never experienced. The likes of people will... <laughs> the likes of... First thing, people will live together like married people, but they're not married. They're just cohabitating. Now, this is 1968. So to her, that was abhorrent. It just it wasn't a thing that was done anywhere. Perhaps it was just coming in. Much uncleanness before marriage. We see it. We were, well, I was involved in it to some degree. Sex before marriage, all those things. Not realising, squandering the... I used to think when I was 13, <laughs> I've ruined my father's integrity that he gave me. I remember having those thoughts when I was 13 years of age that I've wrecked the good morals my dad put in me and my mum. Much uncleanness before marriage and much infidelity in marriage will become natural. It will be justified from every angle. It will even enter Christian circles. And we pet it, even sin against nature. Just before Jesus returns, there will be TV. Now, TV came into Norway in 1968. Programs like we have never experienced. TV arrived in North. Oh, sorry. TV will be filled with such horrible violence that it teaches people to murder and destroy. To kill each other, it will be unsafe even in our streets. TV will be just like the radio where we have many stations. See, this is, you think about it, we've got the internet now. This is TV. And she's abhorred by what's going to happen. Many stations on TV. My goodness. And it will be filled with violence. People will use it for entertainment. We will see terrible scenes of murder and destruction of one against another. And this will spread in society. Sex scenes will also be shown on the screen. The most intimate things that take place in marriage. But the 90-year-old, they'll see the evangelist interjected there. He was horrified that maybe you're not right, lady. Maybe you're not right. But the 90-year-old woman said, it's going to happen. The Lord has told me. You will see it. All we have had before will be broken down and the most indecent things will pass before our eyes. People from poor countries will stream to Europe. There was, a, there was hardly any migration in 1968, especially to Norway, or there's none in Norway. They'll also come to Scandinavia and Norway. There will be so many of them that people will begin to dislike them and become hard with them.
They'll be treated like the Jews before the Second World War. Then the full measure of our sins will have been reached. She says, I didn't understand it at this time. We think about all the Africans and people from other countries that come here or go from Africa to Europe and how they become a pariah on their society. That's how they've looked at them. Like, we don't want them. They're like an infestation. They're like fleas. We want to get rid of them. Not every country is like that. But they're deemed a problem. And yet they're our fellow human beings. This is, you remember, this is through the eyes of a 90-year-old in 1968. At this point, the tears streamed down from the old woman's eyes, down her cheeks. And she said, I will not see it, but you will, talking to the evangelist. Then suddenly Jesus will come and the Third World War breaks out. It will be a short war. She saw it in the vision. All that I've seen of the war before, it's only child, all the wars that she's seen before, it's only child's play compared to this one. And it will be ended with a nuclear atomic bomb. The air will be so polluted that one cannot draw one's breath. It will cover, cover several continents, America, Japan, Australia, and the wealthy nations. The water will be ruined and contaminated. We can no longer till the soil. The result will be that only a remnant will remain. The remnant in the wealthy countries will try to flee to the poor countries but they'll be as hard on them as they were on them in the beginning. She said, I'm so glad I will not see it. But when the time draws near, you must take courage and tell this. I've received it from God and nothing in it goes against what the Bible tells us. This is back then. This is 60, 70 years ago. And you think where the world has gone to now. Now I know why God's humbling me. Because my desire is to fulfill what he wants through me. And I want to ask you today, what does that mean for you? I ask you to be introspective about where you are right now. It doesn't matter about your age, whether you think you're tired or you're too old to do anything. That's poppycock. While you draw breath, while you can pray in the Holy Ghost, while you can read the Word, you've got the power of God at your disposal because you can create, you can do whatever you need to do simply by speaking in line with His Word, by speaking in line with what He tells you, your daily bread that comes in, and you send it out so that God can fulfil it. And it will not come back void, but it will achieve what it's been sent out to do. So age has nothing to do with it. And those of us that got legs and arms to go, we ought to be going. I'm preaching this to me because God has brought me low in these last few weeks and caused me to understand what he's doing. He wants to rid me of pride. And I know he wants to do the same for you. But it's going to take a humbling of yourself before him. It's going to take you to bring yourself low, to prostrate yourself before the living God and be introspective about what he's actually done for you on, on this cross. He gave us all so that we could then go and do this likewise. You know, worldly sorrow, we can feel sorry and we can cry about it. But worldly sorrow only leads to death. But godly sorrow will lead to repentance and lead to life. And so we need to be introspective about our walk with God. 
and take stock, not every six months or every year. I should be doing it every day so that I stay on the path that he's called me to be on because it is a narrow path and the world will take us to other places that we need not be. In Timothy 2.8, Paul said, I desire therefore that men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and without doubting, knowing who they are, praying to the one they know because they've found themselves walking with him and talking with him and knowing what he knows and knowing what he wants. That should be our desire. So, Father, Lord, I want to thank you for the hard times that we come to, the place that we need to count it all joy, learn how to count it all joy. The Father, you would call us to a godly repentance, Lord, godly sorrow, so that we come to the point of understanding each and every day, what we're called here for. Father, I pray for every heart that would hear this word today that would impact them and change their course. Put us back onto the narrow path, Lord, that we all need. Lord, I ask you to bless every person here, bless our families. I pray where there is healing needed, Lord, that you would release healing to those that are hurting, to those that are suffering, Lord. Lord, I pray you would place in every man's heart here the love of Christ to the point where he would lay his life down, not just for his fellow man, but for his wife, for his children, sons and daughters, Lord, that we would be examples to them. And Father, we would stand strong in you knowing that you gave your all for us, that we might live in you. I ask that your blessing would rest on every person here today. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. Help us to prepare, Lord, for what's coming. Help us to keep our eyes on you not to worry about wars and things like this, but to keep our eyes on you, the author and perfecter of our faith. Let your blessing rest on us in this. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thanks, everyone. Um, do you want to do communion, girls? Mm. Sorry, I was... Boys? Thanks, <clears throat> See, you don't need to see me during communion. Please don't take this as a uh, uh, just as a symbol, although it is a symbol. But it's actually a way for your healing to come. Because he gave his body for you. 
And by his stripes, we are healed. He took upon himself every sickness and every disease so that we would not have to bear it ourselves. And through these emblems of the bread and the wine, we can partake of the life that he's given us, the life abundantly that he's bought for us. But through the blood of Christ, we can all be healed. I was going through throat cancer and I was still working of all places um, I had the contract for looking after Centennial Park Cemetery very appropriate when you're going through cancer reminds you every day of where, <laughs> where you don't want to be but a lady came up to me and said I don't know you but my sister said that I would see a man today that worked here and she told me in my prayers, the Lord showed her and she gave me a little book to pass on to you. And it was the book of communion about the bread and the wine and how we appropriate healing through just that one thing. Yes, we remember Christ, but we also remember what he's paid the price for, for you and me, because you are priceless to him. So priceless that he gave his own life, that through his body and through his shed blood, we can have healing. So when you take this today, take it with that in mind. This is what Christ came for. This is what he spoke of. You do it at your own pace. <laughs> Thank you, Lord. There is a bucket on the front seat if everyone, anyone's come to give, you're free to give and you're free not to. And please remember that if you're able to give time uh, during the week, uh, picking olives, it would be very, very much appreciated. Thank you everyone. God bless.